Uh, are you ready? Are you? No, you're not. No, you're not. Ordained to the priesthood in 1989 in, in the Diocese of Erie. Father Larry Richard serves as the pastor of St. Joseph Bread of Life Community in Erie. He's a hard-hitting speaker, preacher, retreat master, and author. The best way that I could figure out to describe him and what he's going to do here today is he's going to encourage the hell out of you. And I just can't put it any other Literally. way. Literally, that's what he's going to do. His talk is spiritual practices to arm us in our battle. Uh, he's got, uh, his first book was Be a Man and uh, really changed my life and changed a lot of guys in our group's life. It starts with the line, you're going to die. Talk about giving away the ending. And so his second one, Surrender, he's got a Catholic men's book out there called, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's his Catholic men's Bible with the famous line, no, no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. Uh, he's host of EWTN radio show called The Reason for Our Hope. That's uh, Monday through Fridays, 9 to 10 a.m. here or 7 to 8 p.m. He is also on EWTN Open Line uh, Thursdays from 4 to 5. Gentlemen, will you stand to your feet and welcome no. Father Larry Richards. <laughs> Gentlemen, have a seat. Sit down. Let's do it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit, which isn't a cowardly spirit, but one that will make us strong, loving, and wise. That you would set us on fire and people would come to watch us burn. We beg you these things, Holy Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus. Pray for us. Good St. Joseph, pray for us. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Are you ready, gentlemen? Yes. I don't think so. Okay. Let's start. Let me see your Bibles. Don't you hold up those phones, you little pagans. Don't you dare. The rest of you are going to hell. So, I'm just telling you now. You need to have a... You ever sit there and see a statue of St. Paul? You see a statue of St. Paul in the United States, we're very politically correct, I don't buy it. But anyway, you go to Rome, by St. Paul outside the royals in Rome, and you go there and there's Paul. And what does Paul always have in his hand? A sword. Now here in the United States, the sword is like this. So oh, look how pretty. In Rome, he is holding the sword up, ready for battle. Gentlemen, the first thing you and I got to deal with, if we're going to enter into battle, is the Word of God. Remember? The theme for your thing is, in, in uh, Hebrews, it says, carry the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Gentlemen, to do battle, you need to get into God's Word. And that's why we talk about no Bible, no Bible, no bed. That means you don't get up in the morning and you don't eat breakfast in the morning till you read from God's holy word. You don't go to bed at night till you read from God's holy word. That way you start your day with God and you end your day with God. We so often start our day with the newspaper or end our day with the newspaper or the news. And what happens to us gentlemen is we become negative. I don't know if you know that because garbage in is garbage out. So you ever have no peace? Because the first thing you do in the morning is you read the paper. The paper, the news, whatever it is, it's always negative. bad, negative, garbage. So you start to get like that. Gentlemen, we are called to be the light in the darkness. And you ever see if it gets really, really dark in a place? You know, it's pitch black. If you light a match, that little flame, the darkness, can never overcome the light. The light is always stronger. So gentlemen, are you part of the darkness and cursing the darkness? It's dark, the world sucks, everything's going to hell. Oh great, I want to be around you. <laughs> or are you the one that brings hope to the darkness? Are you the one that brings Christ to the darkness? Are you the one that brings his light to the darkness? You can't do that yourself, gentlemen. You need to spend time in his word, so I'm going to tell you how to do that. So you need to get a Bible, not on your damn phone. One that you can sit there and hold in different things. And when you sit there, so you can underline it, so you can write it, so you don't sit there. You can have it on your phone. But you need one of these. Remember reading things? It's amazing. A book. Wow, a book. And so, in this way, it's in front of you. It bears witness, too. I mean, this is to what my Bible looks like, huh? It's covered with a nice leather covering, but this is the inside. So what I do is I keep it next to my bedstand. I really have two. So I have more than two, but one next to my bedstand and the one I carry with me all the time. So that way, before I get out of bed in the morning and take my dump or whatever it is, you ever... <laughs> 
Oh, you all know you take dumps in the morning. You know it's true. <laughs> Women do not take dumps in the morning. They go, poof. But anyway, the rest of us, we do our stuff. Anyway, even before you go and do that, you get, before you get out of bed, you turn on the light. <laughs> And you pray the Holy Spirit and you say, Spirit of the God, living God, speak to my heart your word. And then you open up God's word and then you start reading. And then you let the God of the universe hit you over the head with a two by four. And then you stop, listen, respond. That way God speaks to you first before your wife does, before your uh, uh, physical reality or going to the bathroom does, for anything else, you let God speak to you. If not, the way you start thinking in the morning is the way you're going to end in the, afternoon, in the evening. You start with yourself, you're going to end with yourself. You start with God, you'll end with God. And again, what you do when he speaks to you, and the way you can know it's of him, because it'll, don't sit there and fall on the first thing you run into. Because the first thing you might run into, it might be, uh, Judas hung himself. Oh, wonder if he's trying to tell me something. I assure you he's not. <laughs> But you keep reading until God does speak to you. And the way you can tell is it'll give you peace. This morning in the hotel room when I opened up, and then what I do is I write it on a little piece of paper, huh? And then I carry it with me because this is what God said to me today. And now I'm in a dialogue with him all day. You know, people come to me all the time, hey, Father, what? God doesn't talk to me. <laughs> come here. What? God doesn't talk to you. God's always talking to you, gentlemen. What's the problem? You're not listening at all. Not at all. I'm in a relationship with Jesus. No, you're not if you're not going to his word every day. I'm just telling you. Our saint, Saint Jerome, said ignorance of the Bible is ignorance of Christ. Huh? Remember those of you who uh, the bishop prayed it in the beginning here? It says, who made me? God made me. Why did God make me? God made me to know him, to love him, and serve him in this world so I can be happy with him forever and next. So the reality is, gentlemen, is if I was to ask you, do you know Jesus Christ? And I mean know him like you know your wife, your best friend, your son, your daughter. Do you know Jesus Christ? And you can know a lot about Jesus, gentlemen, but not know Jesus. Well, let me give you a hint. I taught all boys for eight years. I had anywhere from 650 to 700 boys. They knew everything about Jesus because we taught them. They had me for a teacher. I taught scripture. And they knew all about it. They knew what a sacrament is, an outward sign and by Christ that gives, uh, gives grace. They knew what the hypostatic union is. Jesus Christ, 100% God and 100% man at the same time. But if I'd sit there and say, do you know Jesus? One kid who went through eight years Catholic grade school, four years Catholic high school, last day of his Catholic high school, I looked at him and I said, son, do you know Jesus Christ? And he looked at me and says, Father, I haven't a clue. And that's a lot of you. You know a lot about Jesus. You go to church, woo. You watch the TV, Bill, Joel Osteen, isn't he pretty? Yeah, <laughs> Jesus loves you, huh? And you think that's knowing Jesus. That's someone else knowing Jesus telling you. You need to know Jesus Christ. And knowing Jesus Christ is by reading him in his word every day. Not listening to Father Larry Richards. He's a bad example. You deal with Jesus first. And the way you're going to do that is you go to God's holy word before you do anything else. Everyone can start doing that tomorrow. 50% of you will not because you're spiritual wimps. It's just that simple. It's too much trouble. Aw. Gentlemen, everybody, and some of you are looking at me like, Father, I hate you. Good. I am tired of being like one of these priests that tickle your ears and say, oh, guys, you work so hard. Oh, you know, that's bull crap. Most of you don't know Jesus. I'm sorry. You just don't. And you need to know Jesus more than anything else. And you can't get to know him unless you know him in his word because that's where he is revealed. Huh? And so every day you got to spend time. So this morning when I went to God's holy word, and I wrote it down, because this way I can be in this dialogue. He sat there and came to Luke chapter 19.38. It says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what I'm here for is to come in his name, not mine. And when we come in his name, we're blessed because of him. And so what has to happen, gentlemen, the first thing you need to do is you need to get the first weapon, God's holy word. And you need to decide. You don't just get one. You have to what? Read it every day, every day, every day. And you watch what'll happen. I, I'm a summer spirit director of seminarians. And so when I start this with seminarians, one kid after a month, he came in and he says, hey, Father, 
you know that works. Really? Ah, uh, really? Like, oh, gee, I've been doing this longer and he's been alive. But anyway, the reality is you need to spend. So the first thing you need to do in your battle is what? Get a Bible and read it, spend time with it. No Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. So before you do anything, you spend time with the Word of God. If He says something to you, and I promise you He will, you write it on a piece of paper. Now God spoke to you, you're in dialogue with Him all day. Correct? So you can be in relationship. And that's the most important thing. The second thing you need to do, gentlemen, to have a, be a good warrior, and that's what we're talking about, is you need to spend time with the Word. You need to spend time with God. And what do we call that? Prayer. You need to pray. And gentlemen, you can go to Mass every week and not pray. Let me give you a hint. You can be a priest of Jesus Christ and not pray. I do a lot of priest retreats and I say, gentlemen, if I could get you to do one thing, if you could just pray. And I'm not even gentle with the priests. I tell the priests, gentlemen, if you're not praying, you've got to do one of two things. You decide to start praying or you get the hell out of the priesthood. Because if you're not praying, you're going to lead people away from God, not to God. And so that must be with all of us. Like, gentlemen, if I was to say to you that tonight someone's going to come into your house and rape your wife and kill your children, would you do everything in your power to stop them? Ooh, you're true Texans. Great. I have my gun. I have a loaded shotgun under my bed, too, as a matter of fact. Because if anyone comes in, I will kill them, but I'll give them absolution before they die. <laughs> so I'm doing them a favor. But the reality is, everybody here, you I hope the bishop's gone. Anyway, everyone is here, sits there, and you would take a bullet to save your wife and your children. Good man. But you know what? If you're not a man of prayer, you leave your family unprotected. Because the world, the flesh, and the devil is going after them every moment of every day. And if you say, oh, that's my wife's thing to pray. Really? God entrusted that family to you. And if you're not a man of prayer, you leave them unprotected. But once you become a man of prayer, you look at the world and the flesh and the devil every day and say, you got to go through me before you get to my wife and kids. When Adam and Eve were there and the temptation came, where was Adam during the temptation of Eve? Right next to Eve. But he kept his mouth shut. The big original sin was Adam wasn't a man. He should have stood up before the devil and said, you got to go through me before you deal with Eve. And that's most men in the United States. They let their women be the spiritual heads of the family. And you take up and you give up your responsibility that Almighty God himself gave you to be the protector. So gentlemen, once you get that word, you need to pray with it because it's an encounter with the living God. So God can tell you what he wants you to do. And again, when you enter into relationship with God, you become a slave of Jesus Christ. A slave. This is what I wear here. You see what this is? It's a chain. Now what's a chain mean? Paul in Romans 1 sits here and says, Paul, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. This is to remind me. This is Larry. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. I exist to live his will, not mine. Gentlemen, once you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must live his will. So every day you come before him and say, Lord, I have plans, not, hey, God, bless me and bless my family. That's all about you. And how many people use God for their glory? You know, bless me, God. Bless my family. Protect us. That's all about you. When you come before God, is God, I exist today to live your will. So again, the theme song of hell is what, you know? I did it my way. Huh? You like that song? You're going to love hell. They sing it there every moment of every day. And did it my way. Hell forever. A Christian gives every day and says, I did it God's way. Not my will, but yours be done. Every time you say the Lord's Prayer, my book, next book coming out is called Just Live It. Just Live It. Living the Ten Principles of the World's Most Famous Prayer. You know what that prayer is? The Lord's Prayer. And every day you say that Lord's Prayer, you say, your will be done. Right? That's what you say. 
But that ain't what you mean. Once a guy came up to me and says, Father, I'm having a bad day. I go, oh, did you thank God for the, your bad day yet? I did not. Did you say the Lord's Prayer this morning? I did. Did you say your will be done? I did. Well, this is his will. Why didn't you thank him? You, he gave you what you asked for. This is his will. What I, what I meant, exactly. You say the Lord's Prayer every day, and you're saying it doesn't matter what I want. It only matters you want. I exist today for your will. Is that what you mean, gentlemen? And see, one of the biggest things we got to do to become men of integrity is we got to live what we believe. And we have to live Christ every day, every day, every day. You know, in the Diocese of Erie, we just did a big study. Since 2006, this is 2014, we have lost almost 30% of weekly attendance of people that go to church. And I'd be, I'd be happy if they were going to the Assembly of God or somewhere, at least they're going. They just stopped going, right? Secularism has infiltrated unbelievably in the United States. It's everywhere. People just stop. Or they get into this me and Jesus type thing, I don't need a community, which will be our last thing we're going to deal with. But it happens, gentlemen, is that we have to sit there and I must be a man of Christ every moment of every day, right? To be a man of integrity, what does that mean? That you are who you are no matter where you are. And so if you're a man of prayer, then you're always, it says in Thessalonians, pray always. Always. So I always got to be in relationship with Jesus. And again, once that starts happening, you watch what will transform in your life. So you've got to be a man of prayer. And so, gentlemen, what I want to do is I want to give you a scripture verse to help you. First place to go, okay? Now, I want you to memorize this. It's not going to be too hard. Everyone's going to be able to handle this, even Larry, okay? So, that Larry. And the reality is, these are the three numbers you've got to know. This is one verse of scripture. Can you handle this, gentlemen? Yes. The first number you must remember is... One. What's the first number? One. The second number you can never forget is one. What's the second number? One. The third number you must know for the rest of your life is one. You got it? So what are those three numbers together? One, one, one. Can everybody handle this? Yes. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. One, one, one. The whole ministry of Jesus Christ began here. In John chapter 1, verse 11, it's the baptism of Jesus. And remember, everything that happens to Jesus must happen to us, including the crucifixion, including the resurrection. But in Mark chapter 1, verse 11, it's when Jesus was baptized. Same thing happens to us when we get baptized. The sky opened up and God the Father said, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Gentlemen, you must get to know who you are. You are God's beloved son. And he's pleased with you. You're here. Are you a sinner? Oh, unbelievable. Wait till I do my examination of conscience. You're going to love that part. But you're going to know you're a sinner. But he still loves you and he's pleased with you. And see, most people think, and that's because they don't know God. They've heard a lot about him. But they think that when God, God puts up with you, right? You know, like, you know, he really doesn't like me, and I'm a great sinner, and every time I come into his presence, he's disappointed. So that's why you don't go into his presence. Because you think all he does is judge you. This holy, holy, holy God, this holy, holy, holy God left heaven and went to the cross to take away your sins. He loves you. And all he wants you to do is come before him, humble yourself before him, and let him love you so that you can go forth and then love others. Huh? That's so important. And so I'd encourage you that you spend time with that every day till you get it. What does that mean? That you keep reading, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased, until you know in your heart. Because if you don't come from your heart knowing who you are before God, then you come with judgment. You bring yourself. You bring the judgment you think God is giving to you. You're going to give to the rest of your family. But the way you come to know that you're loved by the Father, then you'll be more loving towards your wife and more loving towards your children because you know you're loved. And most people, you ever, you ever read that book called uh, Wild at Heart? Remember that book? It's a Protestant book. 
was the first men's book, you know. Anyway, it says all men have a father wound inside of them. So we all walk around with this father wound and, you know, I'm never good enough because I was never good enough for my dad and all that stuff. And we walk around with this wound inside of us. Well, gentlemen, the only place that's going to be healed is when you come to know God as father. A father who loves you. Because then that's what kind of father you'll be. Right? Again, often people come to me and say, Father, I come from a dysfunctional family. Oh, join the crowd. We all have dysfunctional families. One day when I'm an old one senior, I'll be dealing with your kids. And they'll come up and I'll be talking to them and I'll still say, Father, I came from a dysfunctional family. I go, yeah, I met your dad once. I know. <laughs> all of us here are people who are not perfect people. You might think you are. That's why you don't like being talked to like this, do you? You're quite offended, are you not, some of you? Like, cool. It's because you're proud. Because you're proud. You think you already got it together. You don't need anyone to tell you anything because you already got it all. Why'd you even come today, huh? Because you all know, you know it all already, right? You got to come to know humbly who you are. I spend a whole hour with God every day. Every day I wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. You can do it. We're not going to tell you you must, but you could do it. Like, again, I have, we have perpetual adoration at my parish, and the men have to do it in the middle of the night. And when I talk about perpetual adoration, and I say, you need to spend there. That's where you go and you stand before God and say, here I am, God, I'm going to live your will. An hour a week, every, every And guys always say, oh, Father, I can't do that. Oh, I know you're so important. Oh, please, you're just so important. I said, I have the same amount of time as you. We all have the exact amount of time, everything. We all have exactly 24 hours a day. What you do with your time chooses your priorities. If you don't have time for God, your priorities suck. It's just that simple. You know, St. Francis de Sales used to say, everyone needs a half hour of prayer every day. Except, of course, when you're busy. Then you need an hour. Okay? <laughs> That's just that simple. That if I was to sit there and like to the guys, or I'll do it with you guys, I'll say, okay, guys, I need you to sign up for this uh, adoration. And they all look at me like, all right. Said, okay, let's, say it, let's do it this way. Would you do it for a million dollars? If I was to ask you to get up in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, and spend an hour with Jesus for one year, and at the end of the year, I'd give you a million bucks, would you do it? Everybody here would. You know you would. Well, I'd get a million dollars. Uh-huh. Then why wouldn't you do it for Jesus Christ? Why is money more important to you than Jesus Christ? You'd put everything aside to get a million dollars, but you won't put everything aside to follow Jesus more intimately as his disciple. You see, that got to say something to you. you got to be like, wow, I would do it for a million dollars, but I sure wouldn't do it just to be with Jesus. Really? What does that say about your manhood and being a Christian man? And that God spends 24 hours a day, seven days a week with you. And he just wants you to come and be with him. Why? So he can love you. So he can say, you're my beloved. Everybody else in the world is going to come against you. But I will always be with you. Hmm? Every day I do tweets, and I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Twitter, at Father Larry Richards, very simple. And every morning I send out a scripture verse, and every night I send out a scripture verse with a little thing. In the morning it's a kick in the ass, because most people need a kick in the ass, sorry. But at night, it's a very gentle thing. You know, now at night people go like, 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 You know, God loves you, rest in his love tonight. Oh, I love that, Father. Da, 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 da. But then when it comes to the morning one, like, go and make disciples. Go out and make people. Or like very clear, like those who books I already signed. I said very simply in your book, I said, be a saint or go to hell. Okay? That's the point. That's your options, gentlemen. You either become a saint of Jesus Christ or you go to hell forever. Simple! So, you're going to be a saint? Yes. That means you live for God above all things. Period. You become this man of love. You become this man of prayer. And so, that's the second thing. The third thing you got to do. So, the first thing you got to do is get a Bible. The second thing you got to do every day is you must pray. The third thing you got to do is surrender your life to the Holy Spirit. What is that? Surrender your life to the Holy Spirit. Now, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you will be my witnesses. In my Be a Man book, I spend four chapters in the Holy Spirit. Four. And I talk about surrender to the Holy Spirit. And then when Timothy is lying to Timothy, and I love this. Because Timothy is a priest bishop. 
And he still needed to be kicked in the butt. And Paul says, let me remind you, Bishop Timothy, Bishop uh, Priest Timothy, to stir into a flame the gift God gave you when we laid our hands upon you, which is the Holy Spirit. And then he says, the spirit that God gives us is not a cowardly spirit, but one that makes us strong, loving, and wise. The gentleman, when you and I surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit every day, what he does is he sets us on fire, like I talked about in my prayer, and people come to watch us burn. You see, too many Christians that go around, they're kind of like one of my kids who was in my parish just got ordained, and when he got ordained, the week before he called me, he says, come on, Father, let's go to dinner. So we went to dinner, he says, okay, give me some, give me some advice, Father. And I said, one, be a holy priest. We don't need priests that aren't holy. Two, never settle for the status quo. Because the status quo is dead. You need to see, look in where God is calling us next. And so what happens is when you surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit, then he sets you on fire. Now you let people come and be attracted to you because you're burning with God. You'll be like that burning bush because you have God within you. See, what happens, gentlemen, when we're in this battle is we try to do it ourselves. Impossible. I promise. You cannot do it yourself. That's why Jesus said you must go and pray for the Holy Spirit. And he says, and those apostles were all afraid. And once the Holy Spirit came upon them and set them on fire, they spoke boldly. We need men today, gentlemen, that are going to speak boldly the truth of Jesus Christ in love. Not be wimpy, not make excuses because I'm so weak, I don't know what to do. Oh, stop it. You have God living inside of you. One of my favorite authors is a Christian author. His name's Francis Chan. And Francis Chan has a great book out called Crazy Love. It'll drive you crazy if you read that book. Another great book he has is a book called The Forgotten God. And then a book, Forgotten God, he taught, The Forgotten God's Who? The Holy Spirit, as even in your own prayer life, think about it. And so what happens in this, he talks about a man, and he says, can you imagine if this guy wanted to be a good football player? So he prays to God and says, I want to be the best football player in the world. And God comes to him and says, okay, you want to be the best football player? Yes. Okay, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You get out of the way, I'm going to live inside of you, and I'm going to play football for you and with you. Do you think that guy would be a great football player? The best. Huh? Well, God says to you, I want you to be the best Christian. And to do that, I am going to fill you with myself. And I will live the life you're called to do inside of you. You know what's going to be on my gravestone when I die at 120 because a good die young? My favorite verse of the Bible is Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ. So the life I live now is no longer my own. Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I still live my human life, yes, but it's a life of faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. And what does that mean? That see, most of us try to live the Christian life on our own. Like, I'm gonna try harder, God, I'm gonna try harder. I'm gonna try to finally beat this sin. I'm gonna try to be the greatest person ever, God, I'm gonna try. And he says, that's the problem. You can't try enough, it's not enough. I'm going to live inside of you. And so our job is to get out of the way and let people see Jesus Christ. To let Jesus Christ live his life through us. So that comes every day by the surrender to the Holy Spirit. We surrender our hearts and our lives in love to his power. And his power will transform us. And gentlemen, if you think you're busy, you'll get more busy. You can do much more things. You know, I'm a pastor of a full parish. We have a lot of people. I have a lot of kids in my parish. I'm on the road 45 times a year. I've written five books. I have tweets every day. I'm on the radio. I'm doing all these things. But how do I? They say, Father, how do you do that? The Holy Spirit. And so can you. Don't just sit there and say, oh, you must be great, Father. I'm a piece of crap. <laughs> see? He know it. Yeah, see that? God is what's important. And it's his spirit within me what's important. Not me and not you, gentlemen. It's God. So our job is to surrender so people no longer see us. 
they see Jesus Christ living inside of us. And that comes from that daily surrender of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing you got to do to have good uh, uh, practical things, you have to have the Holy Word of God. The second thing you got to do is pray. The third thing you got to do is surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit. The fourth thing you have to do, and this is the hardest, is you must love. Love is not becoming tiptoeing through the tulips. Let me give you a hint. Love, gentlemen, is this. To follow Christ, you must die. Or you're not following Christ. Huh? And so what does that mean? Jesus said in one, I mean in John chapter 13, verse 34, this is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And then in verse 35, he makes it very clear. This is how all people know you're my disciples, by your love for one another. So the number one thing that makes you a disciple of Jesus is if you're a man of love. What's that mean? That you put other people in front of you. You know, so often in the church, we've got so messed up with some people throughout the years. Like, for instance, they'll sit there and take the book of Ephesians. And they'll say, it says in the book of Ephesians, wives, be submissive to your husbands, correct? And so what they say is, you must be submissive to me, and you must serve me. If that's you, leave the church. You give us a bad name. This world doesn't exist to please and serve you. You exist to serve everybody else, if you're his follower. Huh? Now, everywhere I do, every time I do a wedding, and I do a lot of weddings a year, I just did a couple, I do the same thing. And a couple of months ago, I was down in St. Augustine, Florida, and it was two... Uh, um, Secret Service people. Don't forget, it was, a, don't, don't worry, it was a guy and a girl. Don't worry, it wasn't two guys. But anyway, so in the Catholic Church. But anyway, so here we go. And it was down in Florida. And I, one of the, the boy I taught at the high school, I taught all boys. And so he called me down. And the week before, he says, now, Father, I just want you to know Hillary Clinton's going to be there. I go, oh, joy. Anyway, so here it is. I'm doing my stuff. I'm getting ready for the homily. And here's Hillary in the second pew there. And next to Hillary is the Wiener girl, you know, the, the whole thing about her husband, Wiener. Uh, anyway, so, and she's right there. So I'm saying I can't look at them when I'm doing my homily because I'm, yeah, I'm pretty strong. I don't know if you got that yet or not. But anyway, so I always start with the girl. And I do this every, every time I do a wedding. And I say, sweetheart, you read the Bible every day, don't you? And I always get, yes, Father. I say, you lie to a priest, you go to hell. No, Father. And then I'll say, have you ever read the book of Ephesians? And I always get, no, Father. Why? Well, says, you know what it says in the book of Ephesians about wives? No, Father. Well, let me tell you. It says, wives, be submissive to your husbands. And I go, do you think that's what it means? And I always get, no, Father. And then I go, Yes, that's what it means. I jump up and down. I go, for the rest of your life, you must wake up and think, how can I serve my husband? How can I put his knees in front of my own? And all the women are there saying, die, Father, die. <laughs> you know, the green throw-up starts coming out. Heads start spinning around. That's why I could not look at Hillary when this was happening. I will not look. It'll throw me completely. So... All the women are saying, die, Father, die. The guys are saying, that's great, Father. I wouldn't say it, but you say it, yeah. And I looked at the guy and I said, son, that'll cost you another hundred bucks. And he said, best hundred bucks I ever spent, Father. <laughs> now, everybody, anyone that knows me knows I am an equal opportunity offender. The other shoe is about to fall. And so the guys all glum and I say, hey, son, you read the Bible every day, don't you? No, Father. And I says, well, you know what it says in the book of Ephesians after it says, wives, be submissive to your husbands? No, Father. Well, let me tell you. It says, husbands, love your wives. How? As Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. You know what that means, don't you, son? No. <laughs> your life is over. <laughs> Every day when you wake up, you got to think, how can I die for my wife today? How can I put her needs in front of my own? That's love. And love can never be conquered, gentlemen. You need to be this man of love in a world that does not know love. You see, love costs you your life. And see, I think men's movement has been the biggest movement in the church in the United States. And it's going throughout the world. My book's in 10 different languages throughout the world. And I'm going all around the world preaching on what it is to be a man. Because I believe in the next five years, we're going to have a war, gentlemen. And they're going to come for us. 
And we're not willing to kill for our faith. We need to be willing to die for our faith. And when we do that, that blood will rise up new Christians as it's done through the centuries of the church. So God is calling you to be men who stick up for what's right and to be willing to die in love for your family. To defend them, yes. But our main job is to love all people, including our enemies. Jesus' call is so different than some other religions' call. We are to love our enemies, not kill them. And so once I get that heart, like I often say to people, you finally know what it is to be a Christian. When the person you hate the most, who's hurt you the most, you pray that they get to sit right next to you for, uh, forever in heaven. Think about it. That person you can't stand, they sit next to you and are with you forever in heaven. Gentlemen, you'll be redeemed and they'll be redeemed. God died for that person to live forever. And he wants you to be able to do the same. See, to be a person of love will kill you. And that means then, gentlemen, that you need to be able to tell the people you love that you love them, right? You need to be able to do that. Now, some people say, I don't do that stuff, Father. You know, I'm an Irishman or I'm a, I'm a German. Germans don't tell people they love each other every day. Or, Father, I'm Italian. We do it all the time. I love you. I love you. Or, Father, I'm Irish. We do it when we're drunk. You don't let your culture determine your faith. Your faith needs to determine your culture. So Jesus Christ said, His commandment, love one another as I have loved you, is not. And so Jesus told the people He loved that He loved them. Right Now again, in my own life, I grew up in the city of Pittsburgh. God is a Steeler fan. I'm sorry. We have more than anybody else, just to let you know. But the reality, and we make good calls at Super Bowls. But anyway, the reality is that growing up in Pittsburgh, both my parents were cops. My father was a cop. My mother was a cop. My mother graduated highest ever from the Pittsburgh Police Academy. Huh? I always said she missed her vocation. She should have been God because she knows everything. Just ask her. Now, the reality is people often say, I wonder what kind of family father comes from. You ever seen Roseanne on TV? My family's much worse. And I'm not kidding. They're, we are very basic people. My family, everybody swears, everybody does all this stuff. My grandmother used to spend an hour every day in prayer. So basic, regular, solid, salt of the earth, but people are off the wall a little bit. But still, we got to pray. God got to be first, and we got to give away our life for others. Huh? So anyway, in growing up with my father being a cop, my mother being a cop, I knew a lot of police officers, right? I got, and to be a cop, and go around the world and speak to police officers, it's not an easy thing, right? It's hard. Every time you get a call, it's for something bad. I promise. No one calls you and says, Hi, officer. I just want to tell you I'm having a great day today. But someone killed my wife. Someone raped my uh, friend. Someone robbed me. Someone beat me up. It's always bad. And for some police officers, not everybody, but for some to deal with the pain, they drink. I knew one man who became a very bad alcoholic. Very bad. And so he drank and drank and drank. So he left the Pittsburgh police force. He left his wife. He left his kids. And he moved to Las Vegas because we all know everybody's happy in Las Vegas, correct? Yeah. But he got a new wife, new kids, and a big blue Cadillac. This is 31 years ago. In those days, everybody wanted a Cadillac. Now you have your Mercedes or Lexus. But in those days, it was the Cadillac, huh? And he kept drinking and drinking. So after a few years in Las Vegas, he found out everybody isn't happy there. Can you imagine? So then he went and he moved to Houston, Texas. Whoa. Everybody's happy in Houston, Texas, huh? And he became head of security in one of the largest hospitals in the nation, one of the suburbs called Katy. But he kept drinking and drinking and drinking. And this man at the age of 43 years old, which is quite young, is it not? Baby, 11 years younger than me. He was dying of cirrhosis of the liver. I was a senior in college seminary at the time. I'm a lifer. I entered seminary at 17. And his wife called me because I knew him and says, Larry, you know, he's dying. And, you know, it'd be great if you could. Couldn't you come out and see him before he dies? And I said, of course, I'm a seminarian. That's what I do. Yes. And I got in a plane. And I flew out to Houston, Texas. Well, I was not prepared for what I saw. Here was this man only 43, a couple of days before his 41st, 41st, 44th birthday. And I walked in there. He had pure white hair. He had no fat. He was a human skeleton. He couldn't talk to me. He, he looked like he was 90 dying of AIDS. And he had a respirator on him because he couldn't breathe on his own. And I walked into the IC room, and we're the only two there, and I go, 
you look like hell. <laughs> I have a negative humor. I don't know if you figured that out or not. And so he knew it too, and so he's laughing, but he couldn't talk to me. So I had to write here a little blackboard. So I wrote, and it was really a little green board. I would write on this blackboard. And I spent a week with this man, praying with him, being with him for that week. But then I had to go back to seminary. This is in September. So anyway, I said, last time I was with him, he's laying there again with the only two in the room. And I says, listen, I got to get back to school. But it's my senior year of uh, college. So I says, you know, I'm going to be graduating in May. And boy, it'd be great if you could be there. And he shook his head up and down. But we both knew this wasn't going to happen. This man was going to die. Huh? And I said, okay, I got to go. But you know, I'll pray for you. And I start looking at it. And isn't that nice? I'll pray for you. We Catholics can sound so holy sometimes, especially us priests or seminarians. Oh, I'll pray for you. Ooh. -hoo. And I start walking out of the room. But I knew it would be the last time I saw this man. So I turn around to get one last look at him. And here's this man desperately calling me back with his hands. Desperately. And I'm thinking something's terribly wrong. So I ran around the other side of the bed. And I go, what's the matter? What's the matter? What can I do for you? And this man took me. And he grabbed me. And he held me so close to himself. And as he's holding me so close to himself, I looked up at him and I go, yeah. I love you too, Dad. And a little later, my dad died. The only time I ever told my dad that I loved him was on his deathbed. Why? Because he wasn't the type of dad I wanted. He was an alcoholic and he was a mean alcoholic. And I spent my whole life judging my father instead of loving my father. Huh? You know, Jesus Christ, who we all say we follow perfectly or imperfectly, only gave us one commandment, just one. I already gave it to you. Love one another as I have loved you. And then he says, all people will know you're my disciples because you love one another. Period, gentlemen. I don't care if you say 10 rosaries a day. I don't care if you're a holy and you fast twice a week. Jesus didn't say people would know you're his disciples for that. He said people will know you're my disciples. And he gets to decide what makes you a disciple or not. All people know you're mine because you love. Period. And, I, and then he forbid us, the God of the universe forbid us to judge. And boy, we Catholics are great judges, but we're not so great lovers, especially me. And we get mad at people that love, like Pope Francis. Oh, he's not strong enough. Yeah, he's stronger than any of us here because he's willing to be a man of love. And even when the rest of us put him down because he's not strong enough in our opinion. He calls us to be people of love the way Jesus was a person of love. Jesus himself forbid us to judge and he commanded us to love. And then, gentlemen, what does that look like in your family? That means every day you give up your life for your wife and your kids. You exist to die for them every day. So I'd encourage you to do something when you get home today. Put on your mirror in your bedroom, I am third. I am third. I am third, right? And as you put I am third there, when you're brushing your teeth before you go to bed at night, do, 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 and you're reading that, and you think that I do at least one unselfish act today for my wife or my kids. And if the answer is no, you wasted your day in Christ Jesus because you only live for yourself. You need to give away your life every day. And you need to tell those people you love that you love them. Huh? You got to tell them that. And so what, I'm going to give you all homework. Let's deal with the kids first. There ain't many of you. I know. But those of you who have parents and not married yet, I want you to write two letters before you go to bed tonight. One to your mom and one to your dad. And I want you to tell your mom and your dad separately, not in the same letter, that you love them and why. Fathers. If you have 10 kids, it's going to be a long night. <laughs> I want you to write to every one of your children, and I want you to tell them that you love them and why. And this isn't your time to sit there and say, I wish you'd go to church. Shut up. The only thing you do is draw people farther away from God with your judgment to your family. They need to know that you, their father, is willing to die for them. So you sit there and you say, I love you as you are. You're going to love them too much to leave them there, but you can't. If you say, I love you when you do this and this, you don't love them. You're full of crap. You love them where they are, and your love will transform them to where God wants them to be. So you got to sit there, and you got to tell the people you love that you love them. Some of you have to write to your parents. Some of you have to write those who are older, and your parents are oh, my dad never told me I loved, he loved me. Oh, get over it. You be the one to start it.
And this is the way I want you to write. Some of you have to write them to your letters because remember when you were young, you used to call your wife, I love you, no, I love you, I love you more, no, I love you more. You hang up, I ain't gonna hang up, you hang up, you hang up. Hold on, so now it's just, ah, oh, shut up, bam! <laughs> Some of you need to write to your spouses. And this is the way I want you to write these letters. If by tonight, midnight, you or they would be dead, what do you want to say? And some of you, I know about 40% of you will not do this because you're wimps. It's just that simple. Gentlemen, if you can't tell your wife and kids that you love them every day, you better look between your legs because there's nothing there, gentlemen. You understand that? You need that explained a little bit better. You want that to know that you are not a man if you can't look at your wife every day and tell your lover. You are not a man if you can't tell your children every day that you love them. And that I swear. And you might say, where in the Bible does it say I got to do that? You asked the wrong priest. John chapter 15 verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. 16 and 17, now love one another as I have commanded you, as I have loved you. Which means, gentlemen, you are commanded by God to tell your wife and kids that you love them every day. Period. And if you don't, gentlemen, you know, again, you don't decide to pray, you don't decide to love, you don't want to do that stuff, okay, who am I? I'm just a fat priest from Erie and I leave here at 1.30. You'll never see me again. Some of you are happy. Great. But let me give you a hint, gentlemen. If you do as I tell you, you will have a life of no regrets. When you're laying in your deathbed, you're not going to say, I can't believe I told my wife and kids that I love them every day. Stupid, stupid, <laughs> stupid. I can't believe I prayed every day. Stupid, stupid, stupid. But if you don't, I promise you in my almighty God's name that as you're laying there taking your last breath, <laughs> You'll regret your miserable life. You'll regret your miserable life. You'll say, why wasn't I strong enough? Why wasn't I man enough to tell my wife and my kids that I love them? That's all they wanted from me. But I couldn't even do it because I wasn't a man. Gentlemen, today's the day you decide to be the man God created you to be. You decide, stop being a wimp. You decide to start being a man. You decide that I will be a man of love. I will be a man of prayer. I will surrender myself to the Holy Spirit. I will read his holy word. I will live a life of love and I will tell the people I love that I love them. Because life is too short. And that's the last thing I give you now, gentlemen, is we get to the last part of what's that last thing you need. You need to do this together. Jesus always sent everybody out. How? Two by two. You need men that are going to challenge you to do this. See, if it's your wife that's your challenger, that's not a good reality. You need another man that's going to look at you and say, I love you very much, but you've got to stop doing this. Or I'm going to help you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to walk with you. You're struggling with pornography. You're struggling with addiction. I'm going to walk with you as your brother. I'm going to help you. Jesus, who is God, created us to be two by two. You need to find a man, and if you don't have a man in your life that challenges you, a true friend, a Christian friend, you need to pray God that he gives you that man in your life, that he'll challenge you to be the best man you can be. And see, gentlemen, God is equipping us to take the generation and the people around us to the kingdom. And when we're taking them to the kingdom, we're gonna have to fight, but it's a fight of love. It'll cost us our life, but it'll beget eternal life. When you do this stuff, gentlemen, the day you do die, the world will weep because they'll say, there was a man who gave more than he took. There was a man who was more concerned about others than he was about himself. There was a man who taught me how to pray. And gentlemen, to do that, you gotta go back to that one, one, one. You gotta know you're loved, huh? I'm here and I come and I know I'm real hard on you because I only got 50 minutes and I leave. I got to challenge you like no one's ever challenged you before so that this makes an impact in your life and your life from this day forward, this moment, changes forever. That you become a saint. And St. John Vianney said this is the difference. This is the glorious duty of man. You have to do two things for the rest of your life. You got it? 
You got to pray and you got to love. What are the two things you got to do, gentlemen, for the rest of your life? You got to pray and you got to love. You got to pray and you got to love. You got to pray and you got to love. You do that and you're going to be a great saint. As I told you, you have two choices. Become a saint or go to hell. Become a saint, gentlemen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and empower you in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you, gentlemen. Okay, have a seat. Thank you. We're, we're gonna, if the people with the uh, microphones would uh, raise their hand so we know where they're at. We've got two folks with microphones. We're going to have we're questions gonna... and answers now. Q&A for 15, 15 minutes. Herman, if you can 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Put it on the thing here. Make sure you do it. Yep. Okay, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm back teaching the boys again. No, I haven't. Yes, sir. Here, he has a thing coming towards you. Go ahead. Turn it on. You advertise or you want us to read the Bible. Yep. Where do we start? And how Wherever the Lord leads you. That's why I just said you pray the Holy Spirit and you open it up. Some people call it spiritual uh, Russian roulette. You know, but again, you read until God speaks to you. He'll always do that. Now, because again, some people want to read the Bible from cover to cover. If you try to read the Bible from cover to cover, it'll fill your ego. Right? I read the Bible from cover to cover. And you'll usually die in Leviticus. Anyway, you know, it's like, ah, ah, Leviticus, it's so boring. You know, so it, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Now, some people say, well, Father, I read the readings of the church every day. Is that enough? And I say no, because that's spoken to the whole church. God wants to be in a relationship with you and tell you specific things every day. Like when I write these things down, I'm telling you, it really does work. And when you do it before you go to bed, if you go and you have nightmares or if you have uh, night terrors, you need to read the Word of God before you go to bed because then God will take you to sleep at night. Not the news and not the CNN. You need God to do that, okay? So I'm just giving you very basic things about how to start and end your day. It'll transform you, I promise you, gentlemen. Next. Yes, sir. Sure. You can listen to it. But again, though, it's still, you need to have, what does God want to say to you today? You know what I'm saying? So if you just listen to the word every day, like if you go to mass mm -hmm. every day, it's a good thing to do. If you did that, that's part of it. But I still preach something every day. But what God gave me this morning was for me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it was what God, because see, sometimes we don't think, we think that when we pray, prayer is all what we're going to do for God. We say our prayers every day and that, that, that. Prayer, gentlemen, is always more listening than it is talking. The bishop talked about that this morning. But again, it goes right over our heads, right? You know, when the prophet would come before God and say, Speak, Lord, I'm listening, not shut up, I'm talking. And so we need, to, when we pray, we need to have time for silence so God can tell us what he wants. Yes. Are you related, you two? No, yeah. No, okay. We get the same haircut. I know. Uh, I have a problem with humility, so <laughs> could you just bad. tell me to shut up one yeah. time? Humility is truth. So humility isn't going around and saying, you know, I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm no good. Humility is saying who you are and giving all glory to God. It's when we get things in our own egos. Now, you know, someone I ask somebody, I ask crowds like this, what do you think Father Larry's greatest sin is? And what do you think they all cry out? Pride. Is that true? <laughs> sure. But it's still that, I, that is not the core of who I am. I know that everything I do is because of Jesus Christ. You know, when Mary, who's the example of humility, when she was told by Almighty God to the angel, would you be the mother of God? She didn't say, oh no, I'm not worthy. That's all fake humility, garbage. She said, let it be done to me as you will. I live to do God's will. So it's no false like I'm no good, but it's like I exist to live for God, okay? That's humility. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Shutting up is the hardest part in all prayer, but it's the most important. Yes, sir. This is kind of a practical question. Sure. I, I hear you about not judging. Um, sure. I'm sure there's a lot of managers in here. Sure. We've got to evaluate people every day. You've got to evaluate their actions, not their hearts. And that's the whole thing. We can say, like you can say, to have sex outside of marriage is wrong. If you continue to do it, you can go to hell but you don't say you're evil, 
or you don't say you're bad. You say that that action is going to kill you. So if you're a manager and you're evaluating, you can easily, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pastor, I have to fire people all the time. It's when you're the not firing doing. that I have a problem with. The hiring. You, you, no, the firing. Yeah, me too. I don't like it. But sometimes you have to worry about the business and it's the action you're looking at. So Jesus constantly talked about actions, but we can't ever judge someone's heart because we have no idea. Okay? So that's very clear. If Hopefully you know. Go ahead. Father, a little bit different direction. Okay. Uh, you mentioned a 30% decrease in your parish attendance. In the whole uh, diocese. Uh, yeah, we've been yes. doing pretty good. Uh, how are you addressing that, and how are you addressing the issue of vocations? Vocations were starting to grow because, again, with vocations, we'll deal with that first. I'm a big vocation pusher, and I think that the problem the people is, for a lot of years, it's way different now, but priests weren't happy. You know, you'd sit there and see Father, and he had looked like he was constipated half the time. You know, and so... <laughs> He didn't come off as a happy person. And so what has to happen is like I taught all boys for eight years. Eleven guys have been ordained for me teaching there. Because I would sit there and boom, boom. And I'd say, be a priest, be a priest. I just got in a problem with a bishop in uh, southern Florida. That's all I'll go. He wasn't a very pleasant man. But anyway, so I was down there. And we're getting, I'm in a men's conference. And there's all these boys serving. And so every one of the boys, I said, be a priest, be a priest, be a priest. And after mass, the bishop comes running over to me and says, Larry? Yes, bishop. He goes, you almost cost me $50,000. For what? You hit every one of those boys. No, oh, please. But the reality is, like, oh, don't touch, don't feel. I challenge my boys to be priests, and I showed them what it is to be a priest of God. And I say, you got to be holy, you got to pray, you got to be willing to give your wife away. And so we're starting to grow in vocations, unbelievable. And because they have that experience, huh? They're more conservative than I am. But when it comes to the, the, the problem with why people don't go to church, there's plenty of people there. They choose not to go to church. So what we start doing is like when a person misses Mass on Sunday, we have a little thing, I missed you, and I write him a little note. Isn't that bad? You know, and so that helps. But then also, we actually go, in my parish, we go door to door to everyone in the place, and we say, hey, is there anything we can pray for you for? And, you know, you know what Tom is coming up after me. He has the Coming Catholics Come Home program. That's a great program for your diocese. You know, there's certain things, but like when we're, we're talking about closing parishes now, and I got up and I says, we can't just talk about closing. There are thousands of unchurched people. We got to start figuring how we can reach them. And too often we just complain. Again, it's the negative thing. People don't go to church anymore. Well, do something about it, you know? We can go out to the highways and byways. One of the first things I learned in 1990, I was at the Worldwide Retreat for Priests, and the priest got up and he says, uh, Fathers, we priests are great shepherds, but we're not great fishermen. And Jesus called us to be fishermen. And the big difference is the fisherman goes out to where the fish are. And he brings them home. Or he catches them and eats them. But that's beside the point. But the reality <laughs> is you got to go where the fish are. huh? And uh, Pope Francis is saying the same thing. We need to have the, uh, the uh, smell of the sheep on us. So the biggest thing I talk about is we need to have ministries of presence. We go to meetings, we go to places. Like when I'm on the thing, I love to go to bars. Not to get drunk, but they sit there and say, Father's in a bar. Yep. And I can't tell you how many people, how much ministry I can do at a bar without drinking at all. Because I can't just deal. And that's why I love men's conferences. Some of you guys are pagans, are you not? Someone dragged you here, and you don't even like Jesus, and like, you gotta put up with me. But the reality is, but you gotta go where people, they're not gonna come to see you in church. We must go to them. And that's the number one thing we got to change. Yes, 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 sir, sir, sir. Uh, yes, thank you, Father. Uh, thank you, son. Praying uh, and loving. Yes. Uh, uh, over hate. Over so, hate. So, uh, father of a daughter, uh, living a nightmare of a father over a daughter and a man. Sure. So, how do I pray? How do I love that well, man? Well, first of all, the way you pray and love for him is you start fasting for the conversion of his soul once a week. You give up Friday's bread and water for his soul. And then you love him more than anybody else. I'm very big about this is how to evangelize people. First thing you do is you start, you pray for them. So you write, a, 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 you have a prayer list every day and you put his name and your daughter's name and different things on there. And so because when you pray for someone, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like being a magnifying glass. You ever take a magnifying glass and you put it out in the sun? The rays of the sun are everywhere. But when you put a magnifying glass over something, those rays are focused through that magnifying glass and sets that situation or that place on fire. When we pray and fast for people, praying is like placing ourselves as a magnifying glass over them. When we fast, 
We are cleaning the magnifying glass and the grace of God, which is everywhere, is focused through us and will set that person on fire, right? Because you want, you want his conversion more than anything, right? Say yes, Father. Yeah, so the reality is, so the first thing you're gonna do is pray for that person. The second thing you're gonna do is love that person. Now when I talk about love, sometimes gentlemen, love is a kick in the ass, right? But it's done in love. You know, if he's hurting your daughter, to kick his ass is okay. But he gotta know that you love him as you kick his ass. You got it? And the third thing you gotta do, is you got to witness to them. And witness isn't just about saying, because see what we do, you got to know this. Before God gives the Ten Commandments, he first sets his people free from their slavery. We throw the commandments at people without ever them coming to know the love of Jesus. That's why they never change. Because all it is about rules. We are not a religion of rules. We're a religion of love. So you witness, and witness isn't just telling rules. It's showing what Jesus Christ has done for you in your life and how Jesus can set him free too. You got it? So that won't be easy. It might kill you, but that's okay. Okay, go ahead. You got time for yeah. one more question. One more question. They're gonna throw me off the stage. Well, good morning, Father. Good morning, Father. Father. How do you, as you continue to forgive, but you can't forget, Sure. how can you help us on that? Well, again, all you have to do is look at the cross. Huh? Who put him there? You did. I did. And so every time, you know, like, you, you must forgive everybody, correct? If there's one person you do not forgive, I promise you in God's name you will go to hell. I promise you. We must forgive one another or be damned. Simple. Jesus said it at the end of the, end of the book. You know, at the end of if he taught the Lord's Prayer, he says, If you forgive others, then your Heavenly Father will forgive you. If you do not forgive others... Neither will your Father forgive you. When you say the Lord's Prayer, when you say that today, Our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. So, if you hold, if you refuse to forgive a person, you're asking God to refuse to forgive you. That's what you pray every time you say that prayer. Now, forgiveness is an act of the will. It doesn't take away feelings, right? So when you say, the best way to do this is, Jesus, I forgive them, and I ask you to forgive them. It's done. In your heart, you might still have a heart that wants to kill them, right? Like, I want to kill you. But you've made an act of the will. Following Jesus, gentlemen, has nothing to do with feelings. It's a commitment of life. Some days you're going to feel like it. Some days you're not. I am a 54-year-old, soon to be a 55-year-old virgin. You ever see what a virgin looks like? Take a look. Here we go. And some of you are saying, Father, if you looked in the mirror, I know why you're a virgin. Shut up. I didn't always look like this. But the reality is, there's some days I feel like being a virgin, and some days I don't, gentlemen. Let me give you a hint. But it has nothing to do with my following of Christ. I've given in my life. Feelings mean nothing. There are people in my parish I can't stand. Right? It's just, and, there, and there's people who can't stand you, I promise you. So what? Lord, I can't love this person, but you can through me. Help me to get out of the way, and you love them through me. Okay? Thank you very much, gentlemen. God bless you.